네, 다음으로 두 번째 세션에서는 디지털 자산 시장의 미래라는 주제로 이어가겠습니다. Hi everyone and welcome on the Trump Tower. Thank you Blockfesta for having invited us and I am Jaco Marcaro, CEO of the Blockchain Consulting. 아, 네, 블록페스트 관계자 여러분 초대해 주셔서 감사합니다. 지금 트럼프 타워에서 인사드리는 어, 그로스에커 블랙체인 공동 창업자이자 CEO인 지오코마 아카오로입니다. And I am Eloisa Marquezoni, uh, CEO of the same company. We will be speaking today about decentralized finance. 아, 네, 저는 엘로이사 마체론이고 같은 회사 공동 창업자 CEO이자 연쇄 창업자이고 오늘 디파이에 대해서 얘기하겠습니다. And today with us, our correspondent from Korea, Aria, you can introduce yourself. Hello. 저는 아리아라고 하고요. 여기 있는 두 분의 통역을 맡고 있고 또 한국에서 여러 가지 일을 도와드리고 있습니다. The divide between traditional finance and cryptocurrency is very well known. But even within the cryptocurrency space, there is another great chasm that separates centralized finance, CFI, and decentralized finance, DeFi. While both sides share the same goal that is to enable people to use cryptocurrency for financial services, they differ in how they achieve the same goal. The past 20 years, we've seen a great changing in the technology. Music has been totally changed by CDs, then iTunes, and then we dematerialized the music with Spotify. The industry and Hollywood has been totally decentralized by platform like Netflix, Hulu, Apple Plus, presentations by Uber and tourism vacation by Airbnb. Things was to make everyone capable of owning music, movie, transportation. And the second thing was, I would say, the decentralization of that, like Airbnb. I think has not changed at all in the past 500 years is money. The first great breakthrough was the credit card. Then in 2009, Bitcoin. If me and Eloisa and Giovanni Casagrande, our partner, believe that the great breakthrough is the decentralized finance and the fact that we can finally develop money. So with money like Ethereum, we can finally develop money, create smart contracts, and finally we, we, we can give a new shape to the finance. And this is the uh, decentralized finance. Um, the, the first way that um, companies try to uh, gain uh, new markets in traditional economy, avoiding central authorities, used to be through multi-level marketing. And that is so today as well. Decentralized finance and smart contracts, we can use uh, the smart contracts to govern MLM networks uh, and use the Ethereum blockchain to give open access to developers to leverage such technology and customize it for developing the dApps. The entire process will be tied up to single knot in the network, the smart contract, and all processes like user registration, rewards, metrics, table execution, 
until the payment process will be transparent. Could be the way to finally eliminate all fraudulent MLM businesses and let the honest ones fully express their potential in the aid of mass adoption of disrupting technologies like blockchain. Only is money flowing into the DeFi space at the rate of knots, there is a risk that some of the money within it might be over leveraged and could end badly. DeFi could be making, moreover, Ethereum too congested. Um, I think, I do believe that DeFi is the real last revolution of money and finance. Uh, we all hope that uh, DeFi revolution will not end as bad as the ICO bubble did. And we are working 24 hours, seven days a week to make it, make it happen. The decentralized finance take over the traditional finance. That was it. So uh, I hear time is over. Uh, our contacts are um, on the website. Feel free to ask any questions. Or uh, Aria in the audience. Ah, 네 지금 시간이 다 돼서 혹시 궁금한 사항 있으시면 직접 이메일이나 연락을 주시면 되고요. 아니면 아리아에게 연락 주시면 되겠습니다. Thank you so much. Okay. Brava. Good. That was good. Brava. Hi everybody, my name is Jun Ken. I'm the general counsel of O1 Labs, which incubates me in a protocol, the world's uh, lightest blockchain. Prior to O1 Labs, I was the general counsel at Terra, uh, which is a stablecoin company that has operations here in South Korea. I'm honored to be here today representing um, O1 Labs, which is very interested in South Korea's market. And I'm happy to talk about DeFi and its regulatory implications. So if somebody asks me what 2020 was like for blockchain, I would say it was the year of DeFi. And the reason for that is we've seen explosive growth in the number of DeFi projects and the assets are being locked up into smart contracts um, of these DeFi projects. To give you some stats, um, in October of 2020, um, Coinbase processed about $13 billion. In the same time period, Uniswap, which is one of the decentralized exchange, processed about $15 billion. So you could tell that um, DeFi has caught up to uh, centralized exchanges in certain respects. And while it's easy for us to think that just because DeFi is set up the way it is, it's immune from regulatory um, enforcement, and I'm here to dispel that. Um, let's take a look at some of the interesting DeFi projects first. So Compound, which I know is popular in Korea, uh, I think it started the, the DeFi craze um, and we pay homage to it. Uh, it created a simple way for people to deposit cryptocurrencies for yields that are above market and borrowers would uh, uh, put in their collateral and borrow the cryptocurrencies and use it for whatever reason. It was permissionless and censorship resistant, and I think it showcased um, the blockchain technology's benefits. Then came more exotic flavors uh, of DeFi, and I would include Uniswap into this category. It, uh, it created a liquidity pool against which traders could trade and people could um, uh, stake trading pairs uh, into the pool, uh, receive uh, pro rata shares of the trading fees, and uh, the price of the, the state tokens would um, fluctuate based on the pricing equation if that's transparent, and if there's mispricing, um, there was this beautiful arbitrage opportunity showcasing the, the, the benefit of open market as well as blockchain technology. And so people were really showcasing that. And then came more uh, projects like SushiSwap. And SushiSwap I want to focus on today because I think it has a lot of facts that a regulator might be interested in. So SushiSwap was a hard fork result of Uniswap. And a group of developers were not happy with how the governance was run in Uniswap and um, proposed uh, a new protocol that had a governance token called Sushi. Its rise was meteoric. Uh, in, a, in a matter of few days, um, it reached $350 million in market cap. 
and eventually people thought that it would siphon all the liquidity away from Uniswap into SushiSwap when something crazy happened. Um, Noe Chef, which was a key developer of um, SushiSwap, reached his or her hand into that fund and misappropriated $13 million worth of ETH, personally benefiting. And this created a, a crazy outcry in the community and dropped the price of sushi from $12 to $1. What's important to note here is that sushi governance token was listed on exchanges like Binance. So if you're a grandma sitting in Florida, you technically had exposure, could have exposure to this type of price volatility. So if you take a step back, this news reads like what you could see in a newspaper. And if you're a regulator who's in the business of protecting retail investors, alarms going off. So let's take a look at what legal things that regulators could focus on. First, there is securities laws. Um, in US, uh, and I'm going to, to uh, focus my discussion on US laws, um, we have Howey test for determining whether something is a security. The Howey test asks for a very simple thing. You know, did you receive money from people um, and do you have a common enterprise that through efforts of yourselves and others are creating expectation of returns for those investors? If yes, then you have a strong claim for security, which means that any offering of security has to be registered or exempted. Um, if not, then this worry goes away. And a lot of battles are won and lost in many enforcement actions uh, determining the outcome of this particular test. So focusing on SushiSwap, there are a couple bad facts here that I think a regulator um, might be interested in exploring further. First, it's hard to argue that SushiSwap was run and launched in a decentralized manner, right? Because a group of people clearly decided on a listing strategy, a reward scheme, promotion scheme for airdropping sushi to steal the liquidity away from Uni, uh, Uniswap, and eventually, um, they, you know, Noni Chef had such control over the operation to the extent that it was able to misappropriate ETH in um, the protocol's death fund. So these are all the facts that will hurt against and cut against the argument that it's a non-security. Another thing that a regulator might want to focus on is, you know, how, how did you communicate the sushi governance tokens to people when you're promoting it? Were you shilling it? Were you hyping it? Um, were you promising returns? I think these are all the things that, that um, regulators will focus on. Then there are stuff like, oh, before I move on, so what does it mean to be a uh, security for a token? Um, the issuers and the group of developers violate a section five of the Securities Act. Investors could be deemed a statutory underwriter. The platform itself could be deemed unregistered securities exchange, not unlike the enforcement action SEC brought against um, Ether Delta in 2018. So there are some serious uh, consequences here. Um, other areas of laws that people will need to think about is license laws. So in the U.S. there is money transmission law at federal and state level, and FinCEN cast a very wide net of what could be in scope for their um, regulation. So their CVC, which is convertible virtual currency, is defined very broadly to include most digital assets, and if you're an exchanger or administrator of uh, CVC, you have to worry about FinCEN laws. Um, and lastly, there are stuff like AML and KYC, which we know that uh, regulators are very focused on. If I'm sitting in OFAC sanctioned country, and I want to park my money in a smart contract run by your DeFi project, what's stopping me? And what's stopping me from further moving that into another wallet address? So um, it's important to make sure you ask the question of, do I need to do AML, KYC? If so, how do I do it as part of your uh, thought process? Um, in the U.S., Department of Justice is very focused on um, bringing criminal enforcement actions against people that should have had AML uh, and uh, KYC program. And in your local jurisdiction, you might have the same concern, like in Korea, I know that you have to, um, there's Tikkunpop and then you have to register if you're a VASP. Um, do you have to partner one? Are you a VASP? These are legal questions uh, I encourage everybody to, to ask. Um, my goal today wasn't to scare off everybody. Uh, it's, um, I'm a big fan of DeFi personally, and I think it's a technological innovation that showcases the beauty of blockchain. But if there's one takeaway, we should remember that today's silence from the regulators should not mean their implicit approval.
just like it took years for regulators to understand ICO bubble of 2017 and bring enforcement actions in subsequent years, I suspect that to happen for DeFi as well. I think they're, uh, they're gonna want to weed out bad DeFi projects, but what I don't want is for good DeFi projects to shut down because of regu regulatory considerations. Um, aside from that, um, you know, I would mention that, you know, just like 2017 created good altcoins, uh, and I would include Terra into that list, I think we'll see a lot of DeFi boom resulting in amazing DeFi projects. So please think proactively, uh, and if you're an investor, please include these kinds of considerations in your due diligence list. Um, aside from legal points, I would want to mention that I think a lot of people will start expanding the, um, the group of people that will have access to DeFi technology. So right now, I would argue that a lot of speculators and institutional investors are trading, but as we um, include more retail investors or re retail customers, we should make sure we understand that data privacy law is a big issue. So if you're using off-chain personal information, incorporating that into a DeFi project, let's remember that data privacy law of the local jurisdiction is something that you should seriously analyze. And there I would add that, you know, privacy tools like the one uh, Owen Labs is offering uh, with ZK uh, Snark technology is something that uh, people could think about in creatively um, applying for solutions. So that um, is all I had for today. And I want to thank you again for um, allowing me to participate in this event. Hopefully next time I can meet everybody in person. Thank you very much. 네, 잠시 후 12시, 12시부터 오후 1시까지 점심시간이 있을 예정입니다. 준비된 영상은 계속 틀어드리겠습니다. 내일빈 네, 여러분들께서는 식사를 하시고 저희는 잠시 후 1시 뵙도록 하겠습니다. 즐거운 식사 하시고요. 이어서 오션 프로토콜 창립자 브루스... Hello everyone, I'm Bruce Pond, founder of Ocean Protocol. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in Block Festa. Today, only a few companies benefit from the status quo of siloed data. They collect it, mine it, and then monetize it without our knowledge or consent. And people, companies, cities, and even nations are struggling to regain control over their data. The status quo exists because there isn't an open infrastructure for data sharing that gives data owners security, comfort, and privacy. And there also haven't been tools to help people understand the value of their data. Ocean Protocol overcomes these two barriers of giving data owners control and allowing them to monetize their data. We've brought all the capabilities of data sharing in a Web3 native architecture, making it easier for people to publish, price, and sell their data. Just two weeks ago, we launched Ocean V3 featuring data tokens, ocean market, and initial data offerings. It's easy, intuitive, and ready for you to use. The core component of Ocean V3 is the data token. Data tokens are ERC-20 tokens that represent the value of a data asset and provide access to the data asset. The data token is the heart of Ocean V3 as it radically simplifies the user interaction for data sharing while leveraging existing Web3 mental models for custody, wallets, liquidity, staking, and farming. Ocean Market is a place to sell, buy, and curate quality data built on decentralized blockchain technology. In Ocean Market, data services are converted into data assets, uh, the data tokens. Data tokens let people discover the value of their data set and encourage liquid trading of those data sets through our pioneering approach of using balancer liquidity pools integrated directly into ocean market. Data owners publish data and receive minted data tokens, which can then be sold to interested data consumers. And data consumers can buy those data tokens to access the data. Ocean's compute to data feature enables data owners to sell data while preserving privacy because the data stays on with the data owner, avoiding data escapes. The publishing of a data asset as a tokenized 
data asset can be seen as an initial data offering because that tokenized asset can now be used within the existing DeFi infrastructure. With Ocean V3, we're offering an easy to use portal for data monetization. It's an important milestone in the journey to give people back power and control of their data. We're one step closer to an open data economy. Thank you for your attention and I invite you to all explore Ocean Market at market.oceanprotocol.com. Linear Finance is the first cross-chain compatible decentralized Delta One asset protocol to cost-effectively and instantly create, manage, and trade synthetic assets with unlimited liquidity. There's tremendous value in being able to quickly, easily, and cost-effectively gain, switch, and manage cross-asset exposure. However, existing synthetic asset protocols looking to provide this value are still far from a scalable, successful solution. First, scalability is extremely low as it is built on an increasingly clogged Ethereum blockchain with high gas fees. This is particularly pertinent with protocols with high levels of interaction, such as synthetic asset trading protocols. Compounding this are slow price feeds that expose traders to the systemic risk of front running. Faster and cheaper transactions are meaningless if they are front run by traders. Existing solutions are just not scalable. Second, existing synthetic asset protocols have awkward to use interfaces, resulting in the deterrence of new users. The levels of usability and user experience remain low. Current platforms are not designed or used with the intention to really trade synthetic assets. Third, Existing synthetic asset protocols remain a technology product rather than a genuine trading platform for synthetic investment exposure. Simply put, they're not a financial product to trade synthetic assets for investment exposure. The selection of synthetic assets remain limited and uninspiring. In this age, virtually any synthetic asset can be created as long as there's reliable and secure price feed. Imagine a synthetic asset for a global property market index. Given the availability and development in Oracle design, the selection of synthetic assets should be anything but uncreative and stale. Yet, this remains a problem plaguing existing synthetic asset protocols. Given these problems, what is the solution? So at Linear Finance, we believe that cross-chain compatibility is the future of synthetic asset trading. With cross-chain compatibility, users will benefit from the Ethereum standards and familiarity in addition to the ability to conduct and transfer assets to any other supported chains. For example, Lina token holders will be able to interact with the numerous other DeFi protocols that will soon exist in the Binance DeFi ecosystem. But compatibility will not be limited to just the Binance blockchain. Users will be able to interact with any of our supported blockchains as well, opening up a whole world of possibilities to build with other DeFi products. Therefore, with cross-chain compatibility, users will benefit from many of the other existing Legos in the DeFi space, enhancing user experience and lowering the barriers to adoption. Strategically, the combined effect of greater composability, usability, and adoption will complement the network effect on linear finance, bringing in more users and exposure to a wider market base. From a technology and a business adoption perspective, it is clear that cross-chain compatibility is the future of synthetic app trading protocols. So what is Linear's competitive edge? Simple, Linear Finance is faster, cheaper, and safer than existing protocols, as well as being cross-chain compatible. Linear Finance offers near instantaneous execution and substantially lower transaction costs. All smart contract logic can be done on EVM compatible chains such as Binance Smart Chain and any chains that we've already announced officially. These chains have a higher TPS, lower block time, and lower gas fees. With cross-chain compatibility, users are able to avoid paying numerous rounds of fees. This means transactions for our users are faster and cheaper. Our team has also prioritized solving the problem of systemic front-running risk by implementing dynamic, superior Oracle designs, which offer very fast price updates. Linear is a safer protocol for investors and stakers. Welcome to Synthetic Asset Protocol 2.0. Linear Finance is a non-custodial DeFi protocol with unlimited liquidity and possibility in the creation of synthetic assets. It is powered by the Linear native token, Lina. Our Lina token is an ERC-20 Ethereum standard token. 
It acts as the decentralized counterparty and liquidity provider to all trades conducted on the platform for users to create any kind of asset exposure and perform subsequent conversions. In other words, it's the backbone of our protocol. The other important aspect of Lenina tokens is that entitles holders to be part of the linear finance DAO. The DAO will be able to propose and vote on various decisions, such as the listing of different synthetic assets, various protocol integrations, and accepted forms of collateral, along others. As the protocol matures, Lenina will move from a foundation to a DAO structure designed for users, governed by users. Our protocol consists of multiple DAPs in our suite. At launch, we will have the following dApps available for our users, Linear Builder and Linear Exchange. On Linear Builder, users will be able to stake Lena tokens for LUSD to mint synthetic assets that can be seamlessly exchanged on Linear.exchange. Our Linear Exchange dApp will allow synthetic asset trading with counterparties from the stake pool, enabling investment exposure to any asset class. Finally, as a token holder, users will be able to vote on the Linear DAO DAP and be part of the protocol's future governance, growth, and direction. These three DAPs will be soon be available on Wuhan launch and will allow our users to seamlessly create, trade, and manage investment exposure to a variety of synthetic assets on a cross-chain compatible decentralized protocol. As mentioned earlier, current synthetic asset protocols remain a technology product rather than a genuine trading platform for synthetic investment exposures. In addition to superior technology and usability, linear liquids provide 360 degree investment exposure, making linear finance a real financial product for users to easily gain and switch their investment exposures. Upon launch, we'll support innovative virtual asset liquids such as cryptocurrencies, in addition to traditional asset exposures such as commodities and numerous other creative thematic sectors. Linear Finance's management team has diverse experience across finance, business, and technology with the right experience, expertise, and passion to successfully build, launch, and scale the first decentralized cross-chain compatible Delta One asset trading protocol. Thanks and welcome to Linear Finance. Hey everyone, this is Aaron Chen, co-founder and CEO of Injective Protocol. Injective is a layer 2 derivative stack that unlocks the full potential of borderless DeFi. So what are decentralized exchanges? Well, first of all, we can think of it uh, from the counterparts like the centralized exchanges. Well, for those, you can think of the Coinbase, Binance, and OKDXs of the world. There's a centralized server that acts as a central hub of information and relays everyone's trading needs. It also takes custody of your tokens, so you have to trust that they will uh, store your assets securely. Whereas for decentralized exchanges or DEXs, for example, Uniswap, Xerox, and Curve, you take control of your own assets. All trades are settled in a fully peer-to-peer -peer fashion, and in an ideal world, traders can actually communicate with each, uh, each other and relay information in a fully decentralized fashion. Obviously, this has been done before with Uniswap and others, but it doesn't come without its trade-offs. So what does it mean for users? Well, for starters, centralized exchanges are definitely faster, liquid, popular, and generally more convenient. However, it has a lot of centralized risks, such as hacks, which we've seen from Mt. Gox and KuCoin, very high fees, which we've seen from, let's say, Gemini and Coinbase, and general regulatory failures, like what we've seen with BitMEX and also OKEX. As for decentralized exchanges, there are obviously drawbacks as well. It's slower, it has a higher slippage and poor liquidity. Sometimes it is extremely expensive due to gas costs. And in general, since the space is so de uh, being developed actively, it has a poor UX. However, there are some key advantages that DEXs have in general over centralized exchanges. For example, it has really strong regulatory flexibility. It won't be shut down by a centralized government if it was fully decentralized and community-owned. It also has an extremely diverse offering. And beyond that, it's also community-owned. So the exchange is built by the people for the people. So what are derivatives? Most people don't know about this, but derivatives are actually one of the most heavily traded financial instruments out there in the world. 
It's being traded as a financial security higher than stocks and bonds and sometimes even combined. Simply put, derivatives are financial securities with a value that's relying upon and derived from an uh, underlying asset or a group of assets. This means that derivatives can be made out of any assets out there in existence. For example, let's talk about core, which is actually one of the second most common uh, commodity futures out there. Imagine you're a big cereal company such as Kellogg's, which makes popular cereal brands such as uh, Cornflakes. I want to make sure that I secure my price one year down the road. Currently, the corn is trading at $1, but I think that's going to go up to $2. So what do I do? I see that the futures price is trading at around uh, $1.5. So instead of waiting and seeing where the price goes, I secure the price by buying a futures contract at $1.5. Now the corn suppliers are more than happy to do this because it kind of generates cash flow first of all, and second of all, more importantly, it secures their sell for the next year. So there's a bilateral agreement between these two parties, and both parties are happy and more safe for the next year. This is the fundamentals of derivatives. One interesting thing is that for derivatives, since it's being priced as a fraction of the underlying or even as a fraction of the notional, it can be traded on leverage and people can get outsized exposure to those assets. So let's tie it back to crypto exchanges. Generally, the biggest avenue and biggest volume are happening on futures. For example, Bitcoin perpetual futures. And the greatest avenue out there in existence is generally Binance Futures, BitMEX Futures, and also OKEX and FTX and some other avenues. The curious thing is that those avenues are often being highly debated for their reliability, security, and often cause downtimes that are causing a lot of distress from the traders. It also has very low accessibility because they have to ban a lot of regions for compliance purposes. And in general, it has a very high fee as derivatives is the most profitable part of the exchange. But what about the advantages of a decentralized derivative trading? Well, for the servers, since it's fully peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized, there's a lot less censorship requirement for an exchange like that. And just in general, since the fee is distributed amongst all the stakeholders, it eventually flows back to the community themselves. So in general, it actually has a much lower net fees to the community than centralized exchanges. And oftentimes, you're gonna see lower fees just in general. For something like derivative that requires a very high volume, DEXs are not the best infrastructure to support it. For example, AMM currently has very poor liquidity and very high slippage given the capital contributed to the pools. If we were to do that for a derivative market, the LP would be usually at a loss, as a matter of fact, and it will be extremely unfavorable for the traders who are looking to go leverage. So generally, for non-long-tail assets, and mainly the popular assets, AMM models are not exactly the best solution out there. If we were to use an order book model, we actually fall short even more. Because if we use a centralized avenue as the order book, it becomes and operates just in the same way as any centralized exchange. They're forced to face the exact same restrictions such as region blocking, accessibility issues, and just in general, uh, settlement issues. And since settlement actually still happens on-chain, on Ethereum, the trade turnover rate for market makers is much less favorable than any of the existing centralized avenues. So these are a problem we are setting out to solve. First of all, we want to eliminate gas fees because it's one of the biggest costs to trading on DEXs. Second of all, we want to make sure that the entire experience from order discovery, order matching, to order settlement is completely seamless and fast. So this way, the traders will not be scared away by the probabilistic settlement on Ethereum. And the last thing is, we want to make sure that the user experience is in class with existing centralized exchanges, while ensuring that we're fully decentralized. Because if we compromise on centralization, then we are no different from a centralized exchange. So at the end of the day, the biggest question is, what does Injective bring to the table? Well, first of all, we've been working on this for the past two years to truly build an application-specific chain for decentralized derivative exchanges. We started off by ensuring that the entire order book can be maintained in a fully peer-to-peer -peer way while ensuring instant finality. This way, the order book will never lose sync, even after a few blocks of confirmation. 
And second of all, we ensure that there are no gas fees whatsoever, because this way, there are no possible competition and for running issues when it comes to security and operations of the exchange. And most importantly, we have a central limit order book model and a very fast settlement model. So this way, in general, we offer the same in-class experience for a general trader as any type of typical centralized exchanges. So at the end of the day, we bring the best of the both worlds from centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges and present to you Injective. Thanks so much for giving me the chance to talk about Injective. And you can actually learn more about it at docs.injectiveprotocol.com or our website, injectiveprotocol.com. And just in general, follow our Twitter at Injective Labs and message me uh, on Telegram or other channels. Thank you so much.